Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and I've had the good fortune to meet and to become friends with many very special people through L'Chaim and through JBS. And one of my very favorites is a remarkable woman who's made an enormous contribution both to the American social scene and to the Jewish people through her brilliant writing, her teaching, her fearless advocacy for everything she believes in which drives her social conscience and her Jewish soul. It is a wonderful pleasure for me to welcome back to L'Chaim Phyllis Chesler, one of this country's premier feminist authors and models of founding the feminist movement. She's a member of the Jewish community's feminist movement, especially with her work with Women of the Wall, she is a prolific, best-selling author who's written more than 15 books, including now, A No Holds Barred, In Your Face, Profoundly Honest, Courageous Book, Surveying the History of Feminism in America. It's entitled, A Politically Incorrect Feminist, creating a movement with bitches, lunatics, dykes, prodigies, warriors, and wonder women. It's published by St. Martin's Press. It's a memoir of Phyllis Chesler's days as a pioneer of what she calls second wave feminism. If you're meeting Phyllis Chester for the first time on L'Chaim, let me tell you just a little bit about Phyllis. Phyllis is currently Emerita Professor of Psychology and Women's Studies at City University of New York, where she taught for more than 40 years, including the first one to do a women's studies class on the American College campus, ultimately building it into an undergraduate major. In addition to her teaching, writing, and speaking, Phyllis established many services for female students, including self-defense, rape crisis, and child care. Phyllis is a co-founder of the National Women's Health Network, and she's a charter member of the Women's Forum in the Jewish community, in addition to her being a founding member of the Women of the Wall, which seeks to provide women with the opportunity to fully participate in Jewish life at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. Phyllis also helped create the Women's Seder. And Phyllis Chester has a profound impact on society as a whole through her many books, including Women and Madness, Exploring Women's Psychic Experience, Women, Money, and Power, dealing with the economic challenges confronting women. About men, which insists that husbands and brothers and fathers be also taken seriously. And other courageous books such as Woman's Inhumanity to Women and the Ground Shattering, The Death of Feminism and on and on and on, including her personal memoir, which we spoke about here on L'Chaim, An American Bride in Kabul, in which Phyllis painfully describes her marriage and subsequent virtual kidnapping to an Afghan man, which was a formative experience in her life from which she's thankfully escaped both physically and emotionally. Which brings us to a politically incorrect feminist creating a movement with bitches, lunatics, dykes, prodigies, warriors, and 
Wonder Women, a book which has received rave reviews as once again brutally honest, courageous, eye-opening. It's a look behind the curtain at some of the myths of the feminist wizard. This is your finest book. It is brilliantly written. I, it's, it's the kind of book, Phyllis, which when you start, start it, you don't want anybody to interrupt you. You don't, you don't want to get up and have something to eat. You don't want to stop and watch a TV show. You don't want to go to sleep. You just want to read and read and read. Mazal Tov, fabulous, courageous, wonderful. You are a brilliant writer, by the way. There are people who can think and are philosophically wise, but they can't put it into accessible writing. This is an accessible book. It's a wonderful book. I recommend this book to every one of you, but I'm warning you. You start a politically incorrect feminist, you will not want to put it down. Mazal Tov, and thank you so much for sitting in this chair again. It's my pleasure, and now what is there left for me to say? There's a lot for you to answer because I have only a million questions to ask you. Just a million, that's good. Just a million, okay. Uh, by the way, the obvious question, I'm sure you get this everywhere you go, what drove you to write a politically incorrect feminist? Well, a publisher approached me yes. and seduced me and said, only you could and you must and we want. Um, but I've always been a politically incorrect feminist, I know, I always, know, I know. which means on every burning issue of the day, I was part of a very honorable minority that didn't ultimately prevail in the academy or in the media. So, for example, um, on the issue of motherhood, feminists were so focused, understandably, on the right not to be mothers against our will, and the fight against abortion was on us the minute Roe v. Wade was passed, and still is. So my concern about motherhood and about mothers having rights to custody of children and not really historically having these rights was a very minority a concern. My concern about surrogacy being reproductive prostitution and not good for the birth mothers or for the children created thusly. And I was involved in a New Jersey case, very high profile, known as the Baby M case. Uh, that too is increasingly, was then, still is now, a politically incorrect position. Interesting. You know, given the high rates of infertility and the desires to have designer gene babies, maybe carried by someone else because one is too busy to bother, or gay male couples or single gay men who genuinely want a father. And these forces are trying very hard to legalize surrogacy. I think it's a very complex area, but I had a politically incorrect position. Uh, I would say my interest in men, when I published about men, that was funny. I went to some feminist bookstores, and I couldn't see the book, and I would ask where it is, and they put it in the back as if it was pornography, because why would I waste my time on the, quote, enemy? The, the other half of the human race. So you're nodding. In a <laughs> yes. By the way, do you think from day one you were politically incorrect? No. No, when, no. 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 It didn't happen on day one. No, no. Day one, I was very uh, left-wing, more yes. so. And I was very politically correct, only I wasn't following the herd, or so I hoped. I was making it up on the fly. And Women and Madness, for example, which had an enormous supportive following. I might have written that book anyway, but it wouldn't have had the, the effectiveness that it had during a second wave yes. of feminism. Uh, it basically called out the entire mental health establishment for mistreating and pathologizing women as a function of gender bias. And the stereotypes were extraordinary. The punishment was horrifying. And it was very politically correct. I didn't do it to be correct. No, it was consistent, that's it all. Was, and then even women, money, and power was politically correct. Right. Sort of, not everywhere, though. Because one critic, <laughs> one, 
one critic, a friend, said, oh, Phyllis, why even worry about money? We're going to have the revolution done in a decade, and then we'll all have whatever we need. Then another one, also a friend, said, I don't think any woman needs more than $50,000 a year. Finished. And I said, and what if you have a child or two? Oh, well, you open up a drawer, you put the kid in the drawer. I said, uh-huh. So women, unrealistic dreamers, um, revolutionary thinkers, it was really a honeymoon, as so many ideological revolutions are. And then what happened? Human nature asserts itself. It's like the snake in the garden. And the ideologies become ossified and rigid. And it's unwise to stick to them, but very few people think independently. They don't dare to because they'll get in trouble. So they all think they follow the herd, and there's no evolution of thinking. Mm -hmm. You talk in many different contexts in this book about betrayals. One of the betrayals is what you feel the women's movement did to itself, not even necessarily to you. Do you know what mm. I'm referring to? Yes. Speak yes. about that for a moment. In what way, and I don't want to talk about it from a Jewish perspective, no, no. from within the feminist movement, what do you feel was the biggest betrayal of its own idealism? We had the Chinese Cultural Revolution in feminist America, so that, as in all other revolutions, um, we ate our best and our brightest. They were the most suspect. They were the first to be sent to the gulag. Somebody who spoke more eloquently, uh, or who published or had a byline. Kate Millett wrote about this. Uh, she was, they demanded that she not use her name once she used her name, that was a betrayal. This happened in a way to Shulamit Firestone as well. It happened to me. People, that means colleagues at my university, said, well, you're not going to use your name. You're going to publish anonymous. And I said, how quaint. Just as women used to publish. I don't understand. Why shouldn't somebody use their name? Because that would be ripping off the revolution. The revolution is a vast, oh, anonymous it's conglomerate. It's not supposed to be about you. Nobody gets credit. It's the collectivity that matters. Otherwise, you're a raving egotist. OK. Is there any validity to that? No. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. What we need, rather, is to encourage more of same and more people. Mm -hmm. What we need is to raise the standards for everyone not to devastate and lower the standards for all. Do you remember by any chance the first time that was said to you? And I don't mean the day, but mm. roughly how old were you, where were you, when somebody in essence said to you, Phyllis, don't write in your name. It's a betrayal of the movement. Do you remember at all where you were? I do. Where were you? I was in the cafeteria of my campus, and a student, a beloved student of mine, said, that's it, you've betrayed us, you've betrayed me. Everything roughly when taught. is this? How old are you roughly? This would have been in 1971, before I even published. Mm -hmm. And she was distraught. <laughs> that and you were going to use your name. Yes, and I thought, maybe it's the teacher's fault. <laughs> I, I didn't, I really, and then there was a colleague whom I loved, a very poetic gay guy, and he said, well, surely you're not going to go down the road of stardom. I said, it may not sell. You know, It's my name. It's my work. So the idea that ideas belong to the originator is a very important idea. Yes. Many in the feminist movement talking about betrayal think that ideas belong not to the originator and that the originator doesn't have to be remembered or cited, and that, in fact, entire bodies of feminist knowledge can be just disappeared and not taught, which I saw happen in my own lifetime, but by faux feminists in the academy. Um, so that, here's an example. If our early work on sexual harassment and rape and our speakouts, our lawsuits, uh, and our analyses had been taught consistently in universities, we would have had an at Me Too movement by 1980. Mm -hmm. And it would have been a standing mm -hmm. at Me Too movement. 
and it would have included harasses and rapists, not just famous guys, you know, who, but rather the foreman in the factory, um, the office manager, those who were in charge of agricultural workers. Right? But that's not the case, even yet, even yet. So the disappearance of feminist knowledge by faux feminists, pseudo feminists, and happily by the patriarchy itself, you know, is another kind of betrayal. And this is, according to Dale Spender, a wonderful Australian scholar, she wrote a book, Women of Ideas and What Men Have Done to Them. And she charts the systematic disappearance of feminist knowledge, generation after generation. And we see that now. Where do you see in women's studies or in the women's march against Trump, where do you see women's concerns directly addressed? You hear about Black Lives Matter. You hear about transgender rights. You hear about queer theology, which is the title of a course at Harvard now. Uh, you hear about police brutality. These are important issues. All the real way. issues. All real issues. Police brutality against black men. We hear about uh, a prison system that's totally unjust, all true. We hear about climate apocalypse, also true. Where is the domestic violence Very against good. women? Yeah. Where is the How sexual violence yes. against women? Where is the gender stereotyping of toys and fairy tales with a vengeance that continues? You don't really hear about that, do you? And you've spoken about this your whole life. This is not where you're politically incorrect. Oh, what I just said is very politically incorrect. How? Well, In other words, they don't want to hear that they should be talking about women's right, issues? Right, because it's not the sexy flavor of the month. It's, in other words, if we were talking about women's issues, and we're more than half the population, then there would be a lot of revamping necessary. Okay. Such hard work. I understand. On the issue that we just started about, in terms of they didn't want you to use your name, there are very high-profile feminists in America, the Betty Friedans and the Gloria Steinems. They didn't seem to have any trouble having their name used. I'm not so sure. Remember, really? Betty published on her own in 1963, The Feminine Mystique. This was a lonely exercise. There was no group around her you know, de making demands. There was no movement as yet. The second wave movement began with that publication and her forming the National Organization for Women. It then continued, another, there were three streams. The second stream was all of the women who didn't want to be treated badly by men on the left and in civil rights uh, and the anti-war movement, and they did the most creative, most spirited demonstrations, sit-ins, acting out, acting up, right? Uh, beginning with the Miss America pageant, right, right here in New Jersey. And then we had women entering previously all-male professions and transforming them. Astronauts, CEOs, physicians. But weren't their names also important for us to know? Yes, absolutely yes. The group that had the greatest trouble with the naming of names were those who were more Marxist or more leftist mm -hmm. or more socialist. And um, it, it really matched well with female psychology, which is more comfortable with everyone's equal, no one's different, we're all the same, no one stands out, no need to envy the beauty queen, right? We're all the same. So that Marxist psychology, which has a valid analysis, definitely, um, didn't want anyone to stand out. And I was in a CR group. And um, I had to hide what I was doing because it was not what the others were doing. But at a certain point, Marge Piercy, who was in that group, I came 15 minutes late or 12 minutes late. And they were on me and over me and into me. Do you have no respect? Who do you think you are? And Marge said, she's writing the most important book that will save mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. Leave her alone. And I thought, oh, I, lo <laughs> I love this woman. But I mean, look, the mean girl phenomenon, which is now accepted 
and I wrote about it in a single chapter in Woman's Inhumanity to Woman. No different than Man's Inhumanity to Man, by the way, only it's hotly denied. <laughs> the, the mean, I mean, because girls are taught that we have to be very nice. Even if we're really very mean, we have to act nice in the front. And the way girls who become women behave is they slander and they ostracize. Can women be mean? Very, yes. Is it politically incorrect for you to say that? It was totally politically incorrect. It got every major feminist leader very upset with me. Because you were telling the truth. Yes, they said, Women don't publish too. this. Don't, as close to the angels as to the apes. Yes. Uh, by the way, Phyllis, do you hate men? No, no. I love my son more than all others. <laughs> But no, I That's don't. That's a different I, kind of question. I, My, I, I ask you that almost rhetorically because there is an image, and you do refer to this, that the feminist movement had to be anti-male. No, 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 no. I don't, I, I don't say that. There was a moment in time that some feminists felt that men were the enemies and you can't sleep with the enemy, and if you do then you're the enemy too. It was that madness. But not everyone partook of it. Yes. It was, uh, I mean, there are extremists in every revolutionary okay. movement. That's not where you were politically incorrect. Uh -uh. That you insisted you did not hate men. I was not saying I didn't hate men. I said, you know, if men are so powerful, I remember I was thinking this through in 1976, if men are so powerful, how come they go to war and they die because other men are sending them there? This is interesting. So what kind of power do they have? What is the nature of their relationship to their fathers? Because I decided that indeed they scapegoat mothers because they wanted dads who aren't there or who aren't there emotionally. And I was really interested in exploring as if men suddenly had become uh, Martians, and I wanted to study them, because nothing that we were saying or that the feminists were saying made any sense. So then I finally persuaded a friend, there was a very important feminist newspaper, and they didn't review the book, and I said they should at least review it. And so the review came out, and it said, basically, why did she leave us and betray us and desert us? and pay attention to them when we need her to pay attention to them. I think, well, okay, they're not intellectuals. They don't follow curiosity. What can I do? By the way, it's hurt sometimes, hasn't it? <sighs> well, but when you're a warrior, yes, and it's not personal. Girls are at they, a disadvantage. I'm sorry, they make it personal at you. I've seen it. Give me an example. I mean, surely. It's not that, they're at, that they disagree with your idea. It becomes ad hominem about Phyllis Chesler. Well, no. What, what happens is Israel. Israel. Turned everything, didn't it? Turned things. And I don't, don't go, go into it. Yeah. I don't go into I it know, in this book. I know. But I'm telling you. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that, okay? Um, there are so many specifics I want you to address because where does one get to hear someone of your insight and caliber address issues that are burning in American society today? Um, so I'm just going to take them. It doesn't mean I'm taking them in order of importance. In some way, I'm following your book. By the way, you should know that Phyllis begins with a marvelous introduction of her own youth, her Jewish youth. She is born in Brooklyn. She grows up in an Orthodox home. She writes, I should have been a boy, you write. Well, I, listen. Your parents wanted a boy. Probably. Probably. Didn't everybody? <laughs> Isn't it built into not just the Jewish tradition, but the patriarchal tradition? Mm -hmm. I had it when they didn't give me a bar mitzvah, mm -hmm. because the, I, I was the smartest, quote, boy in the Hebrew school class. <laughs> and what's this? No bar mitzvah. 
But, you know, those were the times. Now Orthodox girls of course. have. But, so I'm telling you, it starts with some wonderful description of who in the world Phyllis Chester was as a child. And if you've ever seen our conversation on L'Chaim about her book from when she was married in Kabul, we had a long talk oh. about that. But that's not what this is about. Then. Um, I do want to ask you, even before I take the first issue here, to what extent do you feel your Jewish background, knowledge, sensitivity, informed and drove the secular feminism that you championed from a very young woman? I think to a very large extent. Explain how and why, because the Jewish tradition is often castigated for being anti-feminist. But that's very superficial, mm -hmm. because this, I joined Hashemaya Hatzaiya when I was eight years old. And I think that was because, as a child, trapped in a way, um, I wanted liberation. I didn't have the words. And this is a movement that gave us all kinds of words. Then I studied the prophets when I was young. Justice, seek it, tzedek, tzedek, tirdof. I was all about learning. The Jewish tradition is a treasury, a storehouse of learning. And it's not one rigid answer to every question, on the contrary. So I, did, I wasn't conscious of it. But in retrospect, I see how much my Judaism whether it's my acceptance of it or my rejection of it uh, as a child, made my path possible, mm -hmm. right? And um, my family was not political. I was, I'm a first generation American. I'm the first one in my family who went to college. And we didn't have political discussions. So I was able to make it up as I went along or discover it. So only in the 21st century did it become clearer and clearer to me that my intellectual drive and boldness uh, and independence is very Jewish. That's very lovely. Very Jewish. Why do you say that the criti criticism that Judaism is anti-feminist is superficial? If you begin to study even a little bit of Torah, you're moving through centuries and millennia at 60 levels at once, and you're partaking of such richness that even a girl, if she does this, is going to think, is going to think. And a lot of girls have done it, and a lot of girls are doing it. So it is indeed the very tradition that was withheld for a whole bunch of reasons, withheld from Jewish girls and women through the centuries. It's no longer being withheld. And um, you know, when I try to explain to someone how rich it sharpens your brain, mm -hmm. but it also feeds your soul in a way that secular learning doesn't quite mm -hmm. do. I can imagine someone saying to you, Phyllis, you're one of the charter members, the founding members of Women of the Wall. Women of the Wall, the issue that Women of the Wall are trying to address mm -hmm. is a symptom of the problem that is being described when people say the Jewish tradition and by the way, it's not the Jewish tradition, it's Jewish sociology. There is a difference. Oh, the I sociology of the Jewish people has, in, at times, put women into boxes that do not give them the opportunities that men have. And I know all the halakha, but I'm talking how the real life experience. And so they're thinking to themselves, why does Phyllis say it's artificial when she was part of a the essential movement that typifies and symbolizes the woman's attempt 
to assert herself in the Jewish community. Well, you know, the Women of the Wall was founded by Orthodox women That's right. who were very learned and who yes. I studied Torah with. Yes. And what a group that was. Unbelievable. And with all due respect, I mean, we could say Ben-Gurion made a mistake, allowing religion and state to merge. We could say a lot of things. I'll say one thing, that the Haredim, who oppose women having religious authority and, and autonomy, you know, it could also be a psychiatric matter of some kind. And if it's not psychiatric, then, I mean, I think the tradition, they're terrified that the tradition that they hold dear and holy will be ripped asunder. By women? By not just women, but the men who support us, and by not knowing what to do. And is it by, a legitimate concern? I think it is. <sighs> but wait, that's politically incorrect. Yeah, I know. It, it, it's a concern but it should be moderated. You're absolutely right. It should be, there should be no violence. There should be a peaceful negotiation for as long as it takes. Okay, but you respect the fact that they have a position. Yes, I do. And this is very politically incorrect. It is, sweetheart. I may disagree with them. I may try to persuade them otherwise. But then, what can I say after so much publicity has been brought to bear and now is the excuse for why there's a, a, a terrible chasm widening by the minute between Jews in America and, and Jewish Israel, which is a terrible thing. I would not, my co-editor, Rivka Hout, may she rest in peace, and I published a book about women of the wall in 2002. We decided we're not gonna talk about it because the intifada of 2000 was raging. This was 2002 when Jews were being blown up in buses and everywhere else. I, we didn't want to use this issue, an, an important within the tribe issue, to, to further existentially jeopardize Israel. And so we didn't. Others came who were willing to do so. I think it was a mistake, and I disagree with them as well. Okay. At a different time, we would go into this in depth. I just have too many issues that come out of your book. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> you know, the Jewish tradition defines human beings, male and female, very similarly. They understand that there are differences between them. But every man and every woman, the Jewish tradition says, has a Yetzir Tov and a Yetzir Hara. Oh, it's true. It's true. In contemporary... America, and maybe in contemporary feminism, I want you to speak to this. It's as if there's a notion that if women were in power, there'd be no Yetzirah. This is wrong. <laughs> I mean, women are human beings. I mean, look, uh, were there not women in the South who were spitting on little black children trying to integrate? They were women. Were there not women involved in the Nazi enterprise, the death-eating enterprise? Were there not women camp commandants? Yes, there were. We could go on and on with examples of women behaving no better than men. The problem is that we expect women to be so much better that when they behave like men, they say, my God, it's the devil incarnate. No, it's just a human being who, who is behaving dangerously and, and with evil. It sounds politically incorrect to me what you're saying. Perhaps, but it's the truth. Yes, it is the truth. Yes, it is the truth. Okay. But now you know why it's politically incorrect among feminists? Because women have been so maligned and defamed, just like Israel has been, for so long that there came a moment when we wanted to claim, I didn't, but the movement wanted to claim that women were morally superior to men and more compassionate and more wonderful. This will only take you so far <laughs> because then there's reality. It's not true. Women steal another woman's job, a best friend's husband, um, a woman's idea and take credit for ideas not belonging to her. I could, many examples. If women were in positions of national leadership, would there be no mistakes? Listen, I voted for Winston Churchill and Susan B. Anthony because I didn't like the leaders that we were being offered. So 
No, of course there would be mistakes. Mm -hmm. But again, I have to say, prick a woman, she will bleed. She is human mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And she's at a disadvantage because she's had to push harder and work longer and be better and then also have to make men and other women feel at ease even though she's got this power. So it's not easy. I don't expect, I don't, I don't look at gender anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't even look at all of the variables, the, the balkanized identity variables, who you sleep with, what your race is, to tell me anything about an individual. Mm -hmm. I look at that individual, I see how they behave over time. A feminist does not look at gender. Well, yeah, I look how at gender. You're so interesting, Phyllis. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> uh, I want to talk about rape. Hmm. Uh. I want to talk about sexual assault. Because there seems to be an area of human life. It's not the only one, by the way. I will. I want to. Do, I want to do an asterisk and a parenthesis. Okay. You tell me if you agree with me or you disagree. I have argued that the most important thing in any society is not only that it's colorblind, it's gender blind. What I mean is, I want any woman to have the opportunity to be anything she wants to be, pay the same as a man, and to be able to express herself as she wishes. I want that for my son, I want that for my daughter, I want that for my grandchildren, I want that for everyone. To me, that's the fundamental Teaching of the Jewish tradition, where the, you know, we begin with the notion that when God plants this, this, this idea of a human soul, that we are created in the image of God, as the poetry of the Torah says, it's male and female. It's not male. Right. It's male and female. That's the Torah. Male and, it's in the Torah. People think Adam was created first and then Eve. That's chapter 2 and 3. In chapter 1, God creates male and female together, and both are created in the image of God. And I want every man and I want every woman to have an equal opportunity to realize whatever they want in life. I, I want to give you a feminist midrash just to okay. pull your beard, so to yes. speak. Yes, pull my beard, yes. Yes, yes, because Chava, Eve, is created last. Unlike Adam, not from not Earth. Not in chapter one, No, 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 me. I know, I know. It, it's, it's this creature, male and female yes, I know. together. Yes. At the end, the third story, she is created from human material, not from dust. She's from Adam. She's Adam. from Adam. Th therefore, she's more evolved. Evolved. No? Evolved. That's a yes. That's a good midrash. Yes. Okay. You know, the, mid, the Jewish tradition tends to see it differently, but I like your midrash. Anyway, that's I not my point. I disagree with that, too. I understand. That's not my <laughs> point. My point is this. That's my fundamental conviction about human beings, that there should be no difference in opportunity or in compensation of any kind. Mm. I do not, however, believe men and women are the same. I agree with you 100%. And the reason why is I believe biology also creates personality. There are certain things which men, as lovely as men are, will never experience. They will never carry a life inside them. They will never hold a child to their breast and nurse. The Jewish word rachamim, which we translate as mercy, it's much more profound, is based on the Hebrew word rechem, which is womb, there is something unique about mother love. And that doesn't make a father or a male any less of a quality person. But there is a distinction in how a woman experiences life than a man does. And I want to know, as a politically incorrect woman, a feminist, to what extent are you comfortable no, with I agree my saying? with what you've just said. You do, okay. But, but in fact, let me tell you how... You I, know there are feminists who disagree with I me. I know. 
I know that there, everyone who believes that everything is socially constructed now believes that gender is also up for grabs. You can choose which gender you're going to be, a third one, a sixth one. It's all up to you, and you can get it on your birth certificate, too. So I think this is a bit of madness. But where I really, really saw and was forced to put my nose into it, when my son was about eight years old, he would have, after school, other little boys would come and play in the backyard. They were knocking each other down. They were fighting. I figured, that's the end of them. They'll never be back. They were back the next day, whereas little girls on the block, they would always have like one best friend. And then one day, they would never speak to each other again. And there would be new best friends. They would talk against the old best ones. And I thought, I guess it's hardwired. <laughs> that men can fight and be physically assertive and aggressive and become socialized through this and buddies through this. Fascinating. No, and, then I, and then I looked into it a lot more. And once you look into something, then you, I studied evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, and I was warned by women who were feminists who, who had done this before me, they're going to kill you. And I said, what are you talking about? She, Wait and see. And they were right, because feminist leaders did not support women's inhumanity to women. Now, of course, mean girls are all the rage on Broadway. But when I came out with this in the beginning, also in 2002, I, I was warned for a decade, the men will use it against us. Do you really have to do this? You know, don't bother doing this, and, and so on. I thought, well, maybe those evolutionary biologists and psychologists were right. All right. My point was that while I start, I've explained to you where I started There are from. differences between yes. men and women. There is one in my mind, and I want to hear you speak to this. There is one difference between men and women that, in my view, it's real, but it's sad. Women do not have the same strength that men do. Men can rape. It's not whether women can ever, but basically women don't yeah, right, rape. Right. It's true. And a woman lives with that knowledge that in some way she is vulnerable in a way that a male is not vulnerable. Which brings me to some things you've written in your book and obviously what we're going through in contemporary American society. You write about rape in your book. You tell us you were raped. By the way, how did that happen to you? I was working at the United Nations. I was being paid in a part-time job, paid very well, to put together a feminist conference. A dream job, an absolute dream job, offered to me by a high-ranking undersecretary general. Jerk forgot she was a girl. I thought, oh, he appreciates my drive, my brilliance. Oh, lucky me. So I was, my guard was totally down. I didn't see it coming. And yeah, well, he gave me all these things that I wanted, and he wanted something in return. So he came to my apartment when my son was an infant and sleeping with a babysitter and raped me. He overwhelmed me physically. By I the was way, thinking. He literally rapes you? Liter quite this, literally. This isn't, you're in no, the. No, 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 no. No affair, no love affair, nothing. He said, I've waited long enough for you. And he then threw me down on my couch. Well, being me, you have to understand, I fought, but I knew that I couldn't overwhelm him. Then I started thinking, what would a feminist government in exile do to such a creature? And I went through in my mind <laughs> what we would do to him. I had to make a decision. I couldn't report him to the police. He has diplomatic immunity. And only now recently has the United Nations, for the first time ever, fired a pedophile who they covered for for many years. And I was involved in that process. So what could I do? Could I quit? I needed the money. But more than the money, I wanted to bring these women together from all around the world. You were doing something good. 
I was doing something that I wanted to do. It was good also. And so would I let him drive me off my field of dreams? My answer was no. So it was war. And he packed my steering committee with hateful anti-feminist women who didn't want what I was doing and who went out of their way to hate Israel at me. It was something. And I never was alone with him again. But he did weird things and cruel things, and I write about it. His wife came to see me. She wanted my help because he was threatening to put her in a mental asylum. Did she know what he did to you? No, and I didn't tell her. Um, uh, no, no. So then I got to have my conference. And at the conference, he began sexually menacing other women. He was drunk. And I thought, OK, that's it. And I said, let's confront him. And women from Africa, black women from Africa, as he was, said, let's go and get this dirty dog. And the entire confrontation was cooled out by my white feminist friend. I couldn't understand it. I didn't really, I, I was not prepared for it. Her rationale after the fact was it wouldn't look good for a white woman to accuse a black man of, of anything bad. Was he black? Yes. So, Where was he from? Sierra Leone. So I said, this makes no sense. And she said, well, well you'll, back in New York, you'll get him. I said, I can't. He has total diplomatic immunity. And then back in New York, other things happened that were very strange. With him? No, 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 I never saw him again. Um, no, with the feminists involved, with the feminists involved in this- Conference? Conference, I with see. this betrayal, who cooled out the confrontation, which would have been private, wouldn't have been public, mm -hmm. and who then went on to write the introduction to the proceedings of the conference in my place. And at that point, I said, Gewalt. I called for a meeting behind closed doors. All that I wanted was that we should confront him so that he wouldn't go to his grave thinking he could divide the likes of us. Guess what? They promised to do it, but they never did. They promised to tell the feminists at the conference why I had suddenly disappeared from all of their subsequent meetings, but they never did. And so did you feel betrayed by them? I did, of course. This dynamic, by the way, is not unique. In an incest family, when the girl or boy who's being raped becomes a whistleblower, very often the mother will blame the reporter and will eject the whistleblower from the family because she needs the money that the man is earning or she needs her dignity kept intact. And years later, incest victims are far more haunted by the mothers who didn't protect them, who didn't believe them, than they are by the father who raped them. Two questions for you. Number one, do you have nightmares about this? I don't think so. OK. In retrospect. Wait, 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 hold on a minute. I have nightmares about the betrayal. No, I'm talking but about the rape. Not about the rape. No, in fact, no. And I think that there are many responses to rape that women manifest. There's not a single one. And some women are survivors of rape. Others present as victims of rape. It makes a difference. It's like having a, a, a wound and a scar. When it rains, it might sometimes ache, but you can integrate it, and these, this, these are the ideas of Dr. Judy Herman in her book, Trauma and Recovery, a great book. So it rains, you ache, but you integrate it into your normal life. It doesn't necessarily have to become the absolute sticking point that ruins your life forever after. And this is also very difficult and important knowledge for women to have, that we can survive this and yet, I also write about 
women who've killed men in self-defense, who have just been raped, or who were afraid that they were about to be raped. And there were some very important cases about this in the 1970s, and I haven't seen similar cases since. But, but the idea of the whole, uh, dare we get into it, the, the Star Chamber trial of Judge Kavanaugh. By the way, Star Chamber sounds, and I may be misreading you, that you were critical of the way it was handled. I was. Because? The issue of sexual violence is so important, and I've been writing about it and studying it for nearly 50 years. I didn't like to see it used for partisan political advantage. Mm -hmm. I didn't like to see it used when there wasn't, in this instance, witnesses and corroborating facts. By the way, you tend to be a liberal Democrat. No. At one point, you were a liberal oh, Democrat. Oh, I was a leftist. Right. No, better. You, yes. By the way, one of the things I wanted to ask you is And of course, I'm a you, registered how, Democrat. How, yeah, and you are a registered Democrat. I am. I yes. am. But what it means to be a registered Democrat now was not what it no, meant when no. you were younger. No. OK. But my point was, you come out of the liberal Jewish tradition. I do. But something about this really bothered you. About this, yeah, the star oh, yes, chamber yes, nature yes, of yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. First, I, I, I don't understand why Diane Feinstein waited so long, mm -hmm. and I can't think of a good enough reason. This poor Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, she was like a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this was her real personality or she was tutored, but with the little girl voice and the flopped hair and the glasses and the good girl stuff. I think this is not representing our interests or her interests. Best. Our interests meaning? Well. Whose interests? Who's the our? Women. Okay, okay. Women. The question is now raised, and this was the philosophical issue that under, was the underpinning of the Kavanaugh Star Chamber. Yeah. Comes from the Inquisition, by the way. Most sexual assault occurs in private. Yeah. For a long time, our society never took the women's claim seriously. Correct. The argument is, and I think people here were a little bit disingenuous, nobody was saying that in general, in general, the principle, innocent until proven guilty, should be thrown out. They were saying in a very narrow circumstance of, se of a claim of sexual assault, in that one instance, there could be a presumption, and I, boy, I'm not saying I agree, I'm saying this is the philo philosophical underpinning, that in this one instance where a woman says, I was sexually assaulted by so-and-so. Attempted in this instance. Yes, but by the way, you know, look, we don't, if it happened, and whether it was Kavanaugh or somebody else, we don't want that happening to a woman. No, no, of course okay. not. Okay. And if she says it happened, the argument was that in this instance, the woman should be believed. I want to know, Phyllis, from your perspective, when you hear that argument, women should be believed, and as a result, the presumption is that she's telling the truth. And in this one area of life, the accused, the man, has to prove enough that it isn't true. To what extent are you willing to say in this one area, yes, I'm for that? No, I think you're making a very important point because women not only are not believed, but are then shamed further and blamed also for what was done to them and that this is wrong, very wrong, and has to shift and change. And I was afraid that if she didn't command the day, that it would hurt all of the women in court now claiming they were raped, that it would hurt the momentum of the Me Too movement as well. There was so much riding on this from many points of view. So I found her credible, and I think most women, and there are exceptions, most women why would we say we were raped when we weren't? 
Why would we go to the trouble? Why would we share the scandal and, and be forever tainted? You know, no. So yes, I agree with you, women should be believed. But I also think that if you have a trial of some sort, that the woman, this is tricky, there has to be some corroboration. And she apparently, and again, many women don't tell. She was 15. She was terrified. Maybe she drank too. Maybe she was afraid her parents would really punish her. Maybe she thought maybe the best thing to do is never mention it again. It'll go away, you know, like a bad dream. If so, in this instance, I do not understand why 35 years later she would be so haunted by this attempted rape. It was bad. It happened. It happened to me. As in it happened to her. I'm speaking as if I am her. But I moved on in life. She became a professor. She became a mother. She became a wife. So the presentation of Anne, it led to uh, depression or anxiety or serious psychological distress. I have a little difficulty with that. But I could be wrong. It could be that you know we're just different. And that for her, this was horrifying. And when he was then nominated to the Supreme Court, I could understand she became frightened, really frightened, that this is the caliber of a man to sit on the highest court in our land. And she felt she had to come forward. I think it was mishandled, all of it, from every point of view. And I found him, in the opening statements, credible as well. Afterwards, I think he was coached to go ballistic. It was a mistake. All that man should have said was, something happened to her clearly. I am very sorry that it did. I don't remember it being me, but I was 17. I was drinking. We had parties. I don't know whether you want to hold me responsible in my 50s for what I did when I was a teenager. By the way, you're a feminist. Do you hold a man responsible in his 50s for what he did as a 17-year-old? I think it's an important question. If he committed a crime like murder, if he committed a crime like torture, and rape can be torture, if he raped her and it wrecked her, yes, he should be held accountable. And this wasn't, ex I mean, she wasn't raped. No. It, if he did this at 17, does the life he created in some way atone? Would you have, if you were in the Senate, would you want him on the Supreme Court or not? It's a difficult question. It's not easy for you to answer. No. You're not sure. You understand then? I would look at his decisions. I would look at. By the way, everybody said this guy was a sterling jurist. No one. Mm -hmm. Alan Dershowitz tells me this guy is top notch. He seems to have built an extraordinary life for himself. Do we not believe in Teshuva as Jews? I do. And I, I, by the way, I'm not even convinced he did it. I'm not convinced. How could you be? There are no facts. Yes, and, Bo, and and I feel for this woman, although there are a lot of things about it that we're not, I wasn't comfortable with. But I wanted to hear how you dealt with this, because at the moment, it is the quintessential example of a larger problem. The larger problem is there are women now saying all the time, the Harvey Weinsteins of the world take advantage of me, and they've been, they've had a pass. And we don't want them to have a true, fence this anymore. This is true. Right? It's true. And, you know, it's on both sides of the aisle. No, so what it's I'm not saying. You know, there are Democrats who have also betrayed what we believe the values to be. Yeah, unfortunately, yes. And they're I, public. And it's, it's, it, it comes back to something you said earlier. People are people. And there's good and bad. I, oh, boy, I remember what it was like. And, and I was about as straight a kid when I was 17. I didn't drink. No drugs. 
I wouldn't. To the, I've never drank. I never got drunk in my life. I've never used a drug in my life. My sex life is my business. But I'll tell you, I'm a lot closer to Kavanaugh than anybody else. But I also remember what it was like for to be a 17-year-old kid, and they was horsing around and there was nonsense all the time. And it doesn't mean you ever throw a woman on a bed and jump on her. But it's not rape, and it's. It's complicated. And I know, by the way, no matter what you and I say on L'chaim, somebody's going to be angry at us. But I'm... Welcome to my world. Yeah, <laughs> I, won't, oh, I'm, I just think life is very complicated. And I mean, look, you know, I, I agree with you. What if I was up for a position and somebody said, what do you mean? She grew up in an Orthodox home and she married a Muslim and went to Afghanistan? How could you trust her? Okay, I was a teenager when I met him. <laughs> I was a teenager when I went there, or just turned 20. Have I not made a productive life thereafter? And do we judge you now, or do we judge you as you as a 20-year-old? And by the way, abortion is another very important issue, and you address it in the book, and you're honest enough to tell us you had, you had two abortions, both from the husband, yeah. the Kabul, had the I, Afghan hu husband. But it sounded like it was a very difficult experience for you. Totally. Had I not gotten out when I got out, I would have been trapped there forever. I would have probably died in childbirth, or I would have given birth to a, a very ill child because I had hepatitis. I was very deathly sick. And so I think angels watched over me that I was able to get out. So. I think I totally, I am a true believer in terms of a woman's right to choose. And I work with people who disagree with me. And I respect, and you know, to How be funny. How do they funny, disagree with you? Now, they think that it, abortion is murder. Mm -hmm. And so I say, you know what? No man should be forced to have an abortion against his will. Mm -hmm. Absolutely don't have it. And if a woman is against abortion, I say, you too. Don't have one. It, it's become... I stopped debating the issue many, many years ago because it's like trying to debate Israel. If you're presented with a mountain of lies and with deep zeal behind them, for now maybe there's no more talking. You know, I don't think we should go to war, but we are at war actually on that issue in this country. Are we at war? We are at war because Roe v. Wade has been consistently eviscerated year after year so that there are women in many states in America who have no access to abortion and who have to take freedom buses, so to speak, to far distant states. And if they don't have the money, this is a problem. I remember back when my dear friend Barbara Jones and I helped women find illegal abortions before abortion became legal in New York State. And women have begun to do this again. So for me, I can't compromise on that. No, no I don't like it if young girls are foolish and use abortion as birth control. I don't like it one bit. But would I like it a lot if they had lots of babies that they were abusing and neglecting and I had to pay as the taxpayer for her right to do this? No. It has nothing to do with money. It, it's how you feel about life. I mean, listen, I also, when I was still debating, I'd say I think every drop of sperm, it's a, a soul. And if you drop it or don't use it so it's having a child, it's murder, it's murder. You, you once were there? That was once your position? Well, no. It was a debating uh, shtick. Oh, 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 okay. A Fine. debating Fine. shtick. Right. No. You and I mean, I, I mean, right. the, the, the soul is... not a Jewish is, view. No, no, no. It's, it was a debating shtick. I, I, I see. Okay. Um, what I hear you saying is, even if there are things that trouble you about the way abortion is used in America, you believe that this country should give women the right yes. to make that choice, even if it's a choice you would not make. Yes. Okay. And I agree 100% with you. Okay. So I want to do the Israel part uh. because Phyllis Chesler 
stood for something revered, and you've written classic. You, I, I mentioned, you're a prolific writer, and what you write is always important. Your latest book is not only important, it's a great read. A great read. Ah! Ah. <laughs> but then, there were people in the feminist movement who got very upset with you over Israel. And it's almost as if they turned on you. I want you to tell our audience how that happened and how you felt and how you analyze it. I began, I encountered anti-Semitism in the early 1970s among left feminists and left lesbian feminists. Were you surprised? I was, but I began dealing with it in all kinds of ways, which included taking feminists to Israel and uh, getting feminist signatures against the Zionism equals racism petitions at the UN, which has done nothing effective against genocide, but has managed to legalize Jew hatred very well. That's all they've done effectively. Um, I also worked with the burgeoning feminist movement in Israel, and this is all through the 1970s. But I didn't write a whole book about it. Then I went to, to the conference in Copenhagen, the UN conference on women, but it wasn't on women. It was, again, it was an early Durban. This was a mm -hmm. pogrom psychologically against the Israeli delegation and against Jews there. It was quite extraordinary, and I write about it in the new anti-Semitism. What I did is I then flew to Israel after the conference, and I persuaded the Misrat HaChutz, it was David Kimchi, to let me really organize a genuine feminist conference in Jerusalem. However, I couldn't do it ultimately because they annexed East Jerusalem and I couldn't get the Arab women to come under those conditions. Okay, so I continued on in my feminist work and then the Intifada of 2000 awakened me from a deep slumber and I saw how Israel was being blamed for Arab aggression against Israel. And I saw the propaganda that has been fueled and funded since one minute after Israel won the 1967 war of self-defense, if not a little sooner, how the, the poisonous propaganda bore fruit, very poisoned fruit. And I could not be still anymore. So I wrote the new anti-Semitism in a white heat. And it's interesting, I published a little article, a nothing article, suggesting that we have equal compassion for all the Palestinian people at the mercy of their own leaders and for Jewish civilians who are being slaughtered. And I get a phone call from Haifa, heavy accent, a feminist. You betrayed us. Uh, why? How? You called for the compassion. That's not going to help us. So in Israel, I discovered that there was a left wing determined to bring about the destruction of the Jewish state on the principles of Jewish grounds, Jewish ethics. And then I discovered, more to my horror, and I write about this, the first time a campus riot may have started, may have started with me. In 2003, I was speaking at a grassroots conference, mainly African American women, at Barnard. Wasn't sponsored by Barnard. And I spoke on Women's and Humanity to Women. They loved every word I said, but then some operative afterwards rose and said, We demand to know where you stand on the issue of the women of Palestine. I could have said, I'm lighting candles for them every night, but I didn't. I said, I think you're asking me where I stand on the issue of apartheid, and I oppose it. And Islam is the largest practitioner of both religious and gender apartheid in the world. And the place went crazy. Crazy, crazy. And all of the yichis that I had earned with my lecture and my comedy didn't stand me in, st in good stead. I had to be hustled out for my safety. Now, that repeated many times for me and then for others. And I tried to sound a warning, but... My own people, the feminists, couldn't understand, A, why I was for Israel, 
since it was very politically incorrect, you know, and B, why I wasn't in favor of Sharia law, why I wasn't in favor of women wearing hijab or niqab or burqas. And I tried to say, you know, I was in Kabul. I saw it in situ. I didn't like it. I saw the women kicked to the back of the bus with babies and bundles and wearing body bags. What's to like about it? And they felt that that position was politically incorrect. It was racist. It was Islamophobic. So you have women's studies programs now. You have National Women's Studies Association now giving prizes to professors who write books about true Israel doesn't kill the Palestinians, but they purposefully maim them and cripple them. That's who's getting the National Women's Studies Award this year, somebody named Dr. Puar from Rutgers. And um, I'm horrified. I'm horrified that, that a woman's march, so important in these times, is about Linda Sarsour, who's, and that women are wearing, good women, maybe with sincere intentions, are wearing either pink pussy hats, I don't like them, I've, I'm a feminist, not the fun kind, and or they're desecrating the American flag and they're fashioning them into hijab. Hijab is not an act of resistance against racism. Hijab is not freedom for women. Hijab is a sign that Sharia is coming and that the subordination of women is a beautiful thing. And I'm looking at, and I understand more and more about how fascism rises, and it comes to us, National Socialism, that was Hitler's party. It comes to us not just from the left, my old home, but also is pandemic in the Islamic world, which most Westerners who are educated refuse to see, because they don't, it's partly because the sin and crime of slavery in America can never be well enough atoned for. So one of the ways to atone for it is hijab, Sharia supremacy. In Europe, the sin and the crime of both the Holocaust and of the centuries of colonialism and imperialism just let all the Muslim immigrants in and let them radicalize third and fourth generations and bomb everybody to smithereens so that the Middle East has just moved over to Europe. At its worst, not at its best, not the people from Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan or Pakistan who come to the West because they want to lead freer lives and tell the truth and not have to kill and die. Them I'm in favor of, and I submit affidavits for uh, women, mainly Muslim women, uh, on the basis of my honor killing research, which I publish at Middle East Quarterly. And they're applying for political asylum, and I'm submitting affidavits for them. And yet, faux feminists, pseudo feminists, there are exceptions. There really are exceptions. I get congratulated in bravery and so on, but in whispers. But there are faux feminists who think that my work is racist. You know, how can you? understand no reason. How can you reason with evil? How can you reason with fear? Because so many Westerners are afraid and want to appease violent hombres. And so rather than have your, uh, rather than have your office bombed, don't publish that person. Uh, don't make that kind of speech. Disinvite Ayan Hirsi Ali. Don't give her the honor. Do you know who was behind her disinvitation at Brandeis? Women's Studies. They've accused Ayan Hirsi Ali of being a racist. Dark skinned woman, brilliant from Somalia. How can you reason with this? I mean, I do. I will. You try. You try. Isn't it painful? Oh, it sometimes is. Here's an example, very fresh and recent. A feminist was interviewing me about this book, and I was so glad that finally a feminist wanted to talk to me about it. 
I wasn't prepared, she said. But now, even though you're wonderful, she said all kinds of kind things, she said, I have to ask you to explain your position on Israel. I, right? So I have an answer now. I wasn't that good at the what moment. What would you have said if you had the chance? If I had, I would say, well, you know how women have been defamed and then the taint, it just, the stench clings to the woman no matter what facts you bring to bear. So too Israel. I said, so until or unless you've read as many books as I have and have written as many articles as I have and have monitored the situation and read articles on both sides of every aisle, I don't know how we can have a conversation. That's what I should have said. By the way, are there honor killings today? Yes. Where? Everywhere, including in the United States of America and Canada, our neighbor. They what about are... in the Palestinian world? Yes, absolutely. And I, yes. It's amazing to me that there are American Jews and Americans, bright Americans, who side with a regime that permits and tolerates and in some instances facilitates honor killings. This is for, for a different, you and I are going to talk on L'chaim, but about Israel. It's not for this. But I'm just saying to you it, again as an aside, it is shocking to me that there are Jews who think they should be part of support of the Palestinian movement when the Palestinian movement, not Palestinians, right, the right. Palestinian the movement leadership. is the single most immoral movement on the planet Earth today. It's the biggest con job. Okay. Um, and I'm, I, I, this question, I mean, you have to take this question seriously. It's not meant flippantly. Okay. By the way, let me just say something. The, the, you mentioned Yetzirah. Yes. And the inclination to selfishness as opposed to selfless. To, to evil, to evil, it's to bad, to no good. All right. So this is a kind of half in love with easeful death. This is the Western evolved with guilt and mm -hmm. boredom mm -hmm. that is being seduced by evil and mm -hmm. by unreason. Mm -hmm. Freud understood this. He said Thanatos and Eros, the death instinct. There is something partaking of death yearning and civilizational suicide in this romanticization of terrorists. Mm -hmm. I just meant to mention that. I want to know, to the extent to which you've ever given it thought, somebody doesn't become you by accident. Somebody doesn't become willing using a f turn of phrase, to bear the slings and arrows mm. when you could have made it easier on yourself, but you insist on writing and speaking what you believe to be the truth, even when your colleagues, at one point, your you know, comrade in arms, turn against you. So that when you write politically incorrect, and this is not the first time you've written politically in Ukraine. You do, you do so consciously, willfully, and for purpose, because it means something to you. There's an honest, and I keep saying this, you're honest and courageous in a way I hope is an exemplary model to everybody watching you today. But I want to know where you think that comes from that Phyllis Chesler is this. Heaven. What other simple, single Occam's razor of an explanation <laughs> can there possibly be? What normal person would keep getting herself in trouble, not able to really earn a decent living? You're not living? normal, by the way. You're you know. not normal. You're only the most wonderful. Oh, bless you. And you've written, Embarrassing me. you've written a wonderful book. I really hope the audience understands how enthusiastic I am about this book. By the way, our producer, Carol, couldn't put the book down could not put it down. That's how well this book is written. Gripping story. And by the way, for people of my age and Carol's age, this is also when we lived. 
This is, uh, although it's not my story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's your times. It's my times, and boy, you describe it and you show the contradictions and the paradoxes and the challenges in a brilliant way. You write, by the way, it almost just came out of you. Remember when you said, yeah. like, you had to write this book. Well, once I accepted the task, I, once I was doing it, I was all over my life. Was, was it all easy over. for you to write? Or was this a hard book oh, to write? No, it was not easy. Um, it feels easy. It's such an easy read. It feels easy. Anyway, you know I adore you. Thank I absolutely you. adore you. you. Do you remember how lucky I was when I met you yes. at this Emma Lazarus I thing remember in it. Barry I remember Park? It. And you have been a hero of mine forever. I think what you do is extraordinary. I think the message you give is extraordinary. I think the way in which you do it and the courage you have and the, um, the degree of thoughtfulness, as passionate as you are, you're that thoughtful. I only wish that this was a model for America Day, and it's not, and for the Jewish world today, it is not. You always have a home with me. You know that. And I will chase you. And you have to come often, and we have so much more to talk to. Kol Tuva Hatzlacha, wow. Mazal Tov, on a fabulous, fabulous contribution to America and to Jewish life. And I love you so much. May God bless you for your Thank kindness. You. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. Oh, my. Phyllis Chesler, one of the iconic figures on the American and the Jewish scene the American and Jewish feminist movement, and author of A Politically Incorrect Feminist, Creating a Movement with Bitches, Lunatics, Dykes, Prodigies, Warriors, and Wonder Women. Did anybody give you grief I, that I, you I, wrote I Lunatics and Dykes? I didn't want that subtitle, even though it's true. <laughs> I wanted just a politically incorrect feminist that's enough. But everyone Is this your loved, editor, everyone, who, publisher, what? Yes, and everyone loved it, and anyone who was asked loved it. But here's a secret. Sometimes it was all the same woman. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. do yourself a favor. It's published by St. Martin's Press. Pick it up and put it in your home library. I hope you enjoyed and learned from Phyllis on this edition of L'Chaim, as I always do. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed on this edition of L'Chaim. There was a lot said, and I'd be curious to know how much of it you were comfortable with, or did I or Phyllis ever upset. say something? She says upset. I, let, let us know, and you know I love to read what you write. And I'd love to read it on L'Chaim uh, in future editions. So be in touch with me. Email me. Write me. Post on our Facebook page. And tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends. To life. of Jewish education in media.